come forward, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that very much. And I, I welcome you all this morning to, to a non-court day for me. Uh, <laughs> and like any good lawyer, I'm going to try to know when to shut up here today. But I do need to give you some information about uh, your state court. Um, we've kind of reached, I think, a critical phase in our court and its ability to furnish uh, the services that it has to furnish to our community. I want to start by just giving you a little background on the court. Uh, your state court was established in 1901, and it proceeded with a part-time state court judge until 1991, in which time it had one full-time state court judge, and that was Richard Callard. Um, that continued still as a part-time position, again, until 1991. So here we are now some almost 25 years later, and with the, uh, I think, now desperate need for a second state court judge, and that's what I want to talk to you about. Let me, let me give you a little idea. I know many of you were proactive with the courts. You have been involved. I know Ms. Evans has, has talked with me many times and is actively involved in a lot of the courts, as well as you all have been in terms of, I think, supporting the courts and, and its ability to serve and provide uh, justice in the community. Um, but our state court is, is a very unique court. They were originally established in order to take the burden off superior court. Over the years, the jurisdiction has really become a very definite thing, but I think a lot of folks are surprised to know what a state court does. State court handles both civil and criminal cases. On the criminal side of things, what we most often see, I think people think of it as a traffic court, and certainly we process a lot of traffic cases, but the vast majority of our time is spent on domestic violence cases, on uh, forgery, shoplifting, DUIs, um, and, and rather serious offenses when it comes to misdemeanors. I think folks probably underestimate how many misdemeanors there are in Georgia because in addition to all those things, we do also do traffic offenses. We handle, of course, cases from a lot of different agencies. We have a lot of law enforcement agencies in Lowndes County, as you know. And of course, if you are charged with an offense, even in Hayhira, in Remerton, in Lake Park, and you demand a jury trial, your state court is the only uh, entity capable of offering a jury trial to an individual who demands one. And that case, therefore, must come to the state court. So you have all of those small communities, well, as well as the VSU police, the Georgia State Patrol, the Lowndes County Sheriff's Department, DOT, uh, the game warden, all of those services funnel cases into your state court. Um, on the civil side of things, we have jurisdiction over essentially everything a superior court judge handles with the exception of child support, divorce, uh, alimony, child custody, and those issues. What do we spend the majority of the time on there? Uh, the last case we tried was the death on the high seas case, uh, probably the only case probably tried outside of the coastal Georgia that involved, as you might recall, the death of a number of people on a boat who went out from Keaton Beach and did not return. Uh, that specific case is a very good example, I think, of the time commitment sometimes your court makes. Uh, that case took about 68 hours to reconcile. The jury was here every single day until about sometimes 6 o'clock. The attorneys and I stayed till oftentimes 7 or 8 o'clock. Uh, and I thought I was going to have to bring the jury back on Saturday given the length and nature of the case. Fortunately, they resolved the case uh, in the evening on Friday night. So that gives you an idea. That's about a 12-hour day every single day the court put into that specific case. The, probably the three or four cases tried before that in your state court were all medical malpractice cases. Um, these, of course, have the potential for multi-million dollar verdicts. So it is a court that handles very serious cases within the community. Um, the judge's office itself only has three employees, myself, uh, Ms. Carter, and Ms. Walker, uh, one court administrator, and one secretary. That's it. Um, I've got before you a calendar of what the month of September is like for us. You will see, if you look at your calendar there, that every single day that we have, with the exception of two, are court days for us. This, of course, means that for the majority of those days, I'll be in court all day on the bench. It means that a, at least one staff member, and some of those days, two staff members will be in court. That means no one is in the office. It means that it takes all of us working to try and uh, get cases processed through the court and to offer what we must offer to this community um, 
in <clears throat> terms of offering them trials, motion hearings, thank you, offering them everything that we are supposed to offer as a court to function properly. Um, you, I will just by way of reference tell you that the first of those three days, you'll see arraignment days, the third, fourth, and fifth of September, um, we will process 514 cases approximately on each of those three days. That's 514 on Tuesday, 514 on Wednesday, 514 on Thursday. That's the number of cases that go through your court. That is not dispose of all the cases. That is simply an arraignment. An arraignment is, of course, where you tell the individual what they are charged with and ask them how they want to proceed. Do they want to plead not guilty and proceed to trial? Do they want to plead guilty? So the number of those individuals that show up into court, and we generally will pack the courtroom at the jail. You can imagine how many folks that represents, at least 100 on each session, and that's two sessions a day for three days, um, must be seen and talked to by the staff and by the solicitor's office. Um, to give you an idea of what our calendars have looked like, I just had my staff pull just a few calendars here. This is our civil trial calendar. There are 89 cases on it, uh, 15 pages. And if you care to look at the calendar, you'll see it, it covers virtually every type of civil matter you might imagine. This is our last, very last, criminal jury trial calendar. It is 15 pages and has 140 cases on it. That is not uh, anything unusual. That tends to be typical these days. 140 cases on the actual trial calendar requesting a jury trial. This is our motions calendar. These are all to be handled in one day. Uh, there were 54 cases on this for motions that were filed with the court, uh, six pages of calendar. This is our plea day where we handle walk-in revocation hearings for individuals brought who are alleged to violate their probation who are walked into a hearing rather than being arrested, something we try to increasingly do to minimize the impact upon them and upon the community when the court can do something to intervene and try to get those folks back on track in terms of the probation. Uh, we also handle interpreter cases and pleas. There were 101 total cases on that calendar, five pages. Uh, this is the last non-jury trial calendar and you will see that it had 35 cases requesting non-jury trial. It was four pages long. And this is the last revocation calendar. These are individuals jailed for violation of their probation. There were 122 cases on this calendar. This is not unusual. Uh, this is one of the greatest tasks and burdens the court has, is to see individuals arrested for violation of probation. The vast majority have simply stopped reporting to probation. And when they are arrested, we need to see them as quickly as we possibly can to try and hopefully get them back on track and out of jail. You can imagine that if I have to see all of these folks in one day, and I have merely just a few minutes to talk with each one of them, how long it's going to take me to see all 122 people on that calendar. Uh, I have um, copied for you to give you an idea in terms of uh, objective data so that you're not just hearing from me the burdens upon your court but hearing from somebody who has actually studied what our court has done and you'll see I have provided each one of you uh, information furnished to me by the Council of State Court Judges Administrative Office of the Courts on the first page there is by way of introduction you will see that the information they supplied supports the significant need for an additional judge in the State Court of Lowndes County on the second page there you will note our standing upon state courts throughout uh, the state of Georgia. You will see that Lowndes County has the fifth highest 2011 caseload of all state courts in the state of Georgia. And you'll see and highlighted there on your copy is that not one of the state courts with higher caseloads, that being Clayton, Cobb, Fulton, and Gwinnett, has only one judge. Of the next three counties with smaller caseloads than Lowndes County, smaller caseloads than Lowndes County, not one has only one judge. We are the only court in that list functioning with only one judge. You will see below that a table, table six. You will see the standing of the counties surrounding us in terms of size. You will see that even Bibb County, that's Macon, 
uh, who had 11,976 filings in 2011, has just added their second state court judge. Your state court had 25,209. Basically twice that number if we function with one state court judge. If you will look at Henry County, it had a thousand fewer cases than your state court. It has four full-time state court judges. So you will see the enormous burden placed upon the state court to, to carry out its duties. On the next page is a progress report of how our caseload has evolved over the years beginning in 2007. You'll see that it has an incremental increase from 2007, 2008, 2009, although it has gone up every year. In 2011, it experienced a 36.49% increase in cases. Now you might wonder why in the world did we suddenly see a large number of cases? Well, the legislature, as you'll recall, passed something known as the Criminal Justice Reform Act. This act changed a, changed a number of felony offenses, which have always been felonies in the state of Georgia, and reduced them and made them misdemeanors in an effort to reduce our prison population in Georgia. That burden of absorbing those cases falls on your state court. So instead of being prosecuted and heard in the Superior Court, where there are five judges and a district attorney's office, you now have them in a court where there is one judge and a prosecutorial office. On the next page, you will see they study the individual judge's caseload and establish what they call a judge year value. You will see that that judge year value has, since 2007, been well over uh, the 1.0 that would, you would want, ideally, for one judge. And they are not generous with their time, I will tell you in advance. And you will see the court has functioned with a 1.93 caseload uh, in 2011, that if you added merely 500 more misdemeanors, which we already have, that would increase the caseload to 2.04, and with 1,000 more misdemeanors to 2.15. They conclude there at the very bottom of that page, if the state court were to receive an additional 500 misdemeanor cases that were previously felonies, the judge your value would be 2.04. To put it in simple terms, Judge Edwards is handling and has been handling for years the busiest state court per judge year value in Georgia. So you have, believe it or not, the busiest state court in the state of Georgia based upon the population, the offenses, and the number of cases traversing the court. On the next page, you will see where we are in terms of projected population growth, which directly impacts the caseload of the court as well. And you all know, I'm sure already, that that, that uh, population is expected to increase substantially over the years and that that will continue to place a burden upon the court. I know, of course, that you all have serious constraints upon you with regard to the economic issues in the community, the services you have to provide. And I think as Mr. Pritchard has told you, um, one of the things I promised him when I took office originally eight years ago was that I would not come and ask him or this commission for an additional judge until it had reached a critical situation because I knew that the expenditure of additional funds to do this is something that always places constraint upon the budget. But ladies and gentlemen, that time has come and I see no other way forward other than to limit or cut the services the court provides, which is a, a, a very dangerous proposition. Um, I will tell you that um, the one saving grace, perhaps, of this situation, where we are in this situation, is that anything done by the court now, which of course means that our delegation would have to propose legislation to move forward, um, nothing can be done in terms of that until July 1st of 2014. So I'm not asking you for something right this moment. What I'm asking is for your blessing and your support to move forward, to be able to get this done sometime late next year. Um, and we will continue to do what we have done before in my office, and we will continue to try and support that caseload and provide the people in this community uh, everything they need in terms of their court and it operation, operating efficiently. 
Um, it's something I'm sworn to do. It's something we're obligated to do, and we believe in, and we want to do. But again, this is critical. This is not something that I come to you and ask for simply to make my life easier, to make our lives easier. This is something critical for your court in order to keep it functioning in a way that this community expects and deserves. But I, I, I want to limit what I say to that because I don't want to belabor the point here, but I'm going to be glad to answer any questions you want to ask me right now.